My name is Kenneth Haynes. I started teaching in 1987, the year before Stand and, De Stand and Deliver hit the theaters. I, I ended up spending the re remainder of my career in a majority free and reduced lunch school system where my students maintained a 70% pass rate on the AP French exam for 15 years. About a month ago, the Gates Foundation asked me to, if I'd be interested in delivering a TED talk on this topic that you see here. Cultivating a calling, what made you want to become a teacher and what keeps you motivated? Until the last grain of sand drops to the bottom of the hourglass for me, I'm going to answer the same way when responding to the question, what did you do for a living? I taught. Other endeavors have been afterthoughts. It's a curious perspective right now for me as a local union president to be living the first line of my obituary, but my last best fate would have been to remain in the classroom. I miss it terribly. Ten crates of materials are still in my basement, and 4,000 files occupy my hard drive just on the chance that one of these days I might actually be able to return. The just the distillation of three decades of experience into a 10-minute presentation has proven to be a daunting task. Uh, what follows is more a meditation on the theme of the following quote from Carl Jung. As far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. This is especially true for teachers when children resist instruction. This is Albert Einstein, a young picture of Albert. He, when I think he was probably about five. Albert Einstein was such a child, hard to instruct, by all accounts a notoriously poor student. Yet, armed with only algebra and logic, he would eventually shed his light on all of us uh, by unraveling the nature of the macro universe while attempting to answer a question that he first asked at the age of five. Herr Einstein, the elder, had brought a compass to Albert in his sickbed. And young Albert, in a typical five-year-old fashion, asked the question, why does the needle move? Told that it had to do with mysterious forces that envelop us all and, and surround the earth, an intellect at that point at the age of five was set in motion that in a few decades would plumb the depths of space-time and black holes. That's a black hole feeding. An obscure patent clerk in the early 20th century Germany began to wonder about the effects on magnetism when a mass approached infinite density and, and mass. OK, before Hubble had even realized that millions of nebulae were distant galaxies, Einstein had figured this out with algebra. I've never had that brain. Einstein sparked a more profound understanding of the universe to all of us by attempting to explore in depth his seemingly innocent childhood question that he asked at the age of five. Each of us in this room has a duty to free the minds of children to plumb that sort of question to such depth instead of passively accepting superficial answers. Equally important, we must remember that chance has a role in the formation and timing of our obsessions. And success depends on our ability to focus obsessively on a goal while ignoring distractions. Strangely enough, I share a trait in common with Einstein. It's not math. I, have a childhood, I had a childhood obsession. The establishing shot from my bio would be a wide angle shot of an eight-year-old standing in an apple orchard listening to the Haitian migrant workers speak patois while picking fruit in the trees. There was, there was emotional content in the songs they sang. I remember being mesmerized for days, trying to decipher what they were saying to one another. I wanted to participate in that process, that enchantingly musical melange of, of, of French and African mother tongue planted in me the seeds for my obsession in French language and culture. My passion for languages was ignited during the picking season. 
My first French teacher praised and nurtured my ear for imitation, and a lifelong Francophile was born. But the path to a teaching career would be unconventional for me and circuitous. The detours were many, and they lasted for 25 years. Fanatical zeal for my discipline of choice, which was foreign languages, drove me toward this vocation with interludes in German and Spanish and Portuguese. The wonder I had felt as a boy in the orchard was the light that I wanted to kindle in others. However, early in my teaching career, whew, the realization that many of my students would never share that passion <laughs> placed me very much at risk for a career change. And then I attended a talk delivered by Jonathan Kozel, and a metamorphosis ensued. So here, I'd like you to just stop for a second and close your eyes for about 30 seconds. And I want you to start in darkness, because the theme on this is the young quote. And I, I want you to bear with me and close your eyes and envision the first day of school. The administration has furnished a grade book, a blackboard and chalk, a couple reams of paper, and the children begin to arrive. In every class you will ever teach, there is going to be one invisible child. There's going to be one child that Saint-Exupéry referred to as an assassinated Mozart. One child who leads a life of virtually opaque desperation. And depending on where you choose to teach, it may be several children. It may be your entire class. Our future success as educators depends in large measure on our ability to penetrate the facades that those children construct to insulate themselves from fear and danger and to protect the flickering and all too fragile flame inside. Now open your eyes. Can you spot the homeless child? Are you able to identify the cutter? Do you recognize the schizophrenic tics or the gangbanger? The witness who, is na who narrowly escaped the massacre of her entire village? the foreign national abandoned by her parents here in the United States, the sibling of a drive-by shooting victim. Don't worry, I couldn't do it either, I'm not psychic. Most of this was drawn from dialogue journals and writing assignments. In my first op-ed in my fifth year of teaching, I listed one for every letter of the alphabet off the top of my head. They had all been through my French classes. Our classrooms can occasionally seem like spiritual shock trauma units. Teresa and other students like her are what eventually motivated me to remain in the classroom. A week after attempting to take her own life in her junior year, she showed up in my classroom three hours before the school day began, and we spent that three hours, there went the planning period, we spent those three hours talking about life until school opened. We laid out a plan for how to survive her rather desperate situation at home. And she hugged me as I walked her to the door. And she said to me, nobody's ever called me a great kid before. She managed to navigate my AP class the next year, did her best through trying times. After graduation, we stayed in touch, an occasional email requesting life advice, how to best proceed on some endeavor. A year ago, she asked if I would consider attending her graduation in Texas to affix her intelligence medal for the first time. She introduced me to her squadron at the squadron dinner and said, this is my dad. Earlier in that year, she had graduated from Monterey Institute in Farsi and Dari, the, the two languages of Iran, and has now completed survival school in the Air Force in more ways than one. Last June, I received this card on Father's Day for someone who was like a father to me. OK. And she's now asked me to give her away when she marries. And people wonder why we teach. About halfway into my career, I realized that I was no longer just teaching French. I undertook instead to teach young people that more important than my content area 
was this, that this work was about readying my students for that lifetime of learning to follow. As we wrap up, can you spot the child of poverty who ran away from home at the age of 16 after the constant bickering of his serial philandering and substance abusing parents finally escalated to brutal violence? The seriously unmotivated student who would drop out of high school about a year later to start a job in construction and surrender to the hierarchy of needs? That would be your keynote speaker. This career-long, classroom-based educator and reform-minded union president dropped out of high school in 1970, the one he would teach in later for two decades. I was one of those children lost in the enormous classes of a large suburban high school, just one more disconnected student whose teachers were surely mystified and frustrated by 90th percentile standardized test scores and bottom quartile grades. It was not intelligence or even motivation that was lacking, nor was it for one of a merry band of inspiring teachers. I had those in Prince George's County. Missing for me was a cohesive home life. Life was chaos formed on a foundation of sand. Due principally to serendipitous good fortune, my life did not slip permanently into the shadows of this society. Luck and a few extraordinary public school teachers that managed to reach me even through personal torment. So do not be surprised if I take exception with one of my favorite authors, Saint-Exupéry in Wind, Sand, and Stars, when he sees Mozart assassiné in front of him and he laments, when a new mutated rose is born in the garden, all the gardeners wax rhapsodic. They isolate that rose. They cultivate that rose. They favor it. There are no gardeners for men. Well, there are no gardeners for men. Here I believe Saint-Exupéry to be overly pessimistic. We, the teachers, are the gardeners of humankind. We amend the mind and we sow curiosity. We nurture intelligence and we propagate knowledge. We treasure diversity and we harvest compassion. Real teachers create a safe space for the light of a child's mind to shine. Ultimately, our fulfillment must arise from the ability to turn a child's path outward and to find safe footing in the world. Teachers live to cultivate the human spirit and kindle the fire of consciousness from the darkness of mere being. Let's end with a quote that reveals Einstein's moral compass and probably best expresses why any of us endure the, in this vocation like no other. Only a life lived for others is worth living. Thank each of you for choosing to live with children. <laughs>